Welcome to the True Beauty Brooklyn podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Taylor. Alex is away this week, and we have a very special guest co-host, friend to the pod, and one of my dearest friends, Chelsea Fasano. So you guys will remember Chelsea as the badass who helped to link up Dr. Zoe Thomas with Brooke and her husband Imad from the prison reform episode, and she also answered some of your questions back in episodes 45 and 64. So if you love this episode, and I think you definitely will, Go back and listen to her old episodes, but the sound quality is trash and I don't want to get trolled. So now y'all know the old episodes have really great content. The sound quality is trash. Chelsea is incredible and she's so smart and so insightful that honestly, I think it's like worth mentioning so that you guys can go and just absorb all of her knowledge. So Chelsea's a graduate of Columbia University, where she researched neuroscience, sexuality, intimacy, and spirituality. And one of the reasons that I love speaking with Chelsea is because I think she does an incredible job of just like exploring today's relationships in a really relatable language. And she uses science so you can connect it with your rationality and also emotionally. So you asked some awesome questions. Um, I last minute asked you guys in our stories if you could... uh, Well, more so if you wanted a free gift, (laughs) if you guys wanted to get a little bit of a relationship advice or if you had any questions about sex to send them in. And you sent us some really great questions. So if you like this episode, please be sure to write us in because we really want to make Chelsea a regular appearance on the show. I think that sex and relationships are obviously super complimentary to beauty. So write us in truebeautybrooklynpodcast at gmail.com. Let us know what you think and send us any questions that you may have for future episodes. So without further ado, enjoy this episode with me and one of the smartest women I know, Chelsea Pisano. Enjoy, guys. Hi, everyone. I'm Chelsea Fasano. I um, have a degree from Columbia University in psychology with a specialization in neuroscience uh, related to human sexuality and contemplative practices. I also uh, worked for many years in sex education, and I currently work as the chief of staff at a psychiatry practice. So I... um, I'm very interested in the intersection of psychology, sexuality, and um, the human experience at large. I love it. I'm really excited. We asked you guys a couple days ago on Instagram if you had any questions, and we got a couple of really good ones, I think. So we should just jump in, and I'll wind you up. Okay, so this is from Rebecca. And Rebecca said, ah, okay, I have an embarrassing sex question, and I know it's probably common, but... I have an anxiety and take meds for it. Even before I took meds, even if I was aroused, I wasn't like slippery wet. Side note, ick. Let's rename that. Another side note, I'm probably reading too many fantasy romance books because it's unreal how ready all girls are. But honestly, how? (laughs) How do I bring this up? Do I need to say something? Because let's be real. Ego is real when it comes to sex for both parties. And is it just lube to the rescue? Or is there something else Mm -hmm. I can do to help with this? So there's many layers to this question um, and a lot of information about this particular case. The first thing to be said is that there's many different kinds of medication that can be prescribed for anxiety and each of them have a different side effect profile. So how that could be interacting with arousal would be uh, depending on the medication, which I don't know uh, specifically what it is. However, I will say that a common prescription for anxiety is uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, also known for short as SSRIs, antidepressants. And uh, one of the little known side effects of antidepressants is actually a reduction in sex drive, a uh, harder time orgasming, and sometimes the inability to orgasm. So the reason for that is um, that one of the the things that happens when serotonin increases in the brain is that you increase inhibition in the brain and that can reduce arousal. So that could be one thing that that's going on. Um, however, the issue she's talking about was happening before this. And it's, it's a bit of a double edged sword sometimes when people struggle with anxiety because anxiety itself can also be a very challenging for people when it comes to sex. 
And the reasons for this are actually quite interesting uh, and I think applicable to a lot of women in general, which is that arousal occurs in phases. And so our nervous system is divided into two halves. One of them is the uh, sympathetic nervous system, which is often known as fight or flight. And the other is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest or digest, rest and digest. And so essentially, we all kind of know that feeling where we get butterflies in our stomach and our heart is racing, whether that's because we have a test coming up or because we have a crush on someone, right? There is that sense, the fight or flight response in the body. We all know what that feels like. And we also know what it feels like when we're really, really relaxed. Mm-hmm. And then we there's a real gradient of of states in between these things where you can be too excited or too nervous or you can be so relaxed or bored. Mm-hmm. So optimal arousal happens when you're at a really good medium point in between those two things where you're relaxed enough to feel really safe, but you're excited enough to feel engaged And in the beginning of the cycle of arousal, specifically, the relaxation part is actually more important. So in order to get really aroused, the first prerequisite is that you have to feel relaxed enough for that to occur. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the way that we evolved, for most of our history, we were in the wild, right? The vast majority of the way the human nervous system was developed was in that state. Mm -hmm. And so essentially, this is wired into us, especially for women, to make us sure that we're not going something bad isn't going to happen to us once we start having sex because Mm -hmm. when you start having sex you lose awareness of your surroundings so the nervous system is wired so that we can only start to really engage in that when we're relaxed enough so when your resting level of anxiety is very very high it's really hard for your nervous system to get into that state where you can really get aroused. And this is not only a problem for people who have specific anxiety problems that are diagnosed, but it can be true of any uh, any person when they're overly stressed. Mm-hmm. Um, so a good book to read on this is Emily Nagoski, Come As You Are. She talks about this and how there's essentially the idea that instead of pushing on the gas, sometimes you need to take your foot off the brakes. And when you have a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress, essentially, you could try to kind of push the gas all you want. You could try to kind of increase your excitability and push your arousal. But if your nervous system is stuck on, the brakes are stuck on, your anxiety is stuck on, nothing is going to work. So in these cases, it's sort of counterintuitive to get aroused. You might not do things that you would sort of associate with sex, but it might be something more like emotional connection, taking a bath, having a cup of tea, making sure that you feel good with your partner and that you feel accepted in all of those emotions that make you feel like you can let down your guard. And that might change what's going on with her lubrication. Uh, But there's a few more points about lubrication in general that I think should also be addressed. One is uh, vaginas are vary in the amount of lubrication they produce. So each woman will produce vaginal secretions, and that happens all the time for everyone. Mm -hmm. Some women produce a lot of them and others less so, and the texture and consistency and all of that varies vastly. So often what happens is that uh, for a lot of women, their vagina just naturally produces a lot of fluid, for others less. And there's nothing wrong with being on either side of the spectrum. So she could have a vagina that just happens to not be as generally lubricated or generally produce as much fluid. And that is something people don't really, you know, discuss enough. And then the third factor is something that could be going on as well that I'm reading a little in between the lines about, but it's so common. I think it's worth bringing up, which is that because of the way sex education occurs for most people, which is either it doesn't occur or it occurs through porn, which is not an accurate representation of the way that sex really works, especially for women. What often happens is that we rush through the initial stages of sex way too fast for most women to become properly aroused. So if you watch porn, what you're really looking at is, in my view, and most sex education, uh, most people in sex education will agree with this, a lot of premature penetration. So the amount of time from the meeting of two people to penetration, it would generally for most women to be fully lubricated and fully aroused, that just takes way longer and way more foreplay, way more kissing, way more making out, way more connection and way more oral sex and all of those things that should be occurring before penetration occurs. So she might not be becoming lubricated enough just because she hasn't had enough time and a foreplay. And that is probably the most... uh, 
obvious solution is that, as she said, sometimes these things are tricky to talk about, but the best way to make your partner feel good about sex is usually to figure out what works for you so that you have a genuinely positive response rather Mm. than kind of trying to fake it and make them feel better about things, which most people sense, right? Um, Requesting specifically what would work for you or trying things until you figure out what works for you. That's usually the fix. So that is a long list of possible things that could be going on, but I thought it was important to address each point specifically uh, because they're all very important points. So I think that exactly what you're saying, Chelsea, instead of putting your foot on the gas, you should take your foot off the brake. Genius. Yeah. And just to add a final point, it's often really, really, really hard for women to figure out what they want, period, how to express it. Second, how to express it while making sure that the partner feels okay and good. Third, and we don't live in a world where women's sexuality is talked about as openly as, you know, would be good <laughs> in my yeah. view. Um, and so it's hard when you don't talk about something with your girlfriends and you don't talk about it with your parents and you don't talk about it with your therapist and you don't really hear that much information about it on a daily basis. And then you get in a room with one person and suddenly you're supposed to know how to have a conversation that you've never had before and do Mm -hmm. it while you're having sex sometimes. Mm -hmm. And usually that's just too much for women. So a lot of women get into the cycle of kind of pretending that they're having a good time because they just don't know what else to do. And Mm. when you do that for long enough, it becomes really, really hard to break it because then you have to tell your long-term partner, well, actually... I've been kind of not really enjoying this as much as you might have thought I would. And that's hard to get over. Yeah. But so what I'm trying to say is you're not alone. I think the struggle is a lot more common for women than most women realize. And I think that's part of why Emily Nagoski's book that I mentioned was so popular, because so many women are just kind of confused about why things aren't working for them. Mm -hmm. And that book answered a lot of those questions, which is that, For women specifically, often sexual arousal is a lot more about context and it's a lot more about emotional connection and it's a lot more about psychological arousal and it's also a lot more about relaxation. And Mm -hmm. those things are not skill sets that we mostly learn. Somebody was saying this to me recently and it made me so sad because I really do like Megan Thee Stallion and she in that she was saying, you know, just to speak about our bodies in the same way that men have spoken about them all this time doesn't make it okay because now we're just saying it. And it doesn't make it empowering because we're just saying it. Mm -hmm. And it's the truth, (laughs) you know, although sometimes I do like to, you know, work out to WAP or any of those songs (laughs) because you feel good. It makes you feel like empowered, but it's like because you've been conditioned to feel like that's what empowerment should feel like because it's from the male gaze. Yeah, I think that's an issue that is not really even just about sex, but something that many women go through in general, which is how do I separate out my own identity from what I've always been told is what I should be Mm -hmm. in terms of we grow up and from such a young age, our every moment is so infused with trying to be what others want us to be that it often takes some serious work to figure out who we actually are and then how do we want to express that in the moment and that of course extends to sex because you're not going to just suddenly drop that as soon as you get into the bedroom and you know start hanging from the chandelier and swinging around and (laughs) not giving a you know (laughs) yeah yeah. not caring what others think okay Rebecca you've got another question this is a (laughs) two-parter So she says, another question, and oh my God, this is going to be worse than the first, but I'm a child of the 90s and my parents were into church, so no sex before marriage and literally no one talked about it and only the quote unquote bad girls had sex young when we would have talked about it, so I never got a good masturbation talk. I'm in my 30s and never had a good masturbation talk and I don't know how or what or when. What you got for Rebecca Chelsea? Well, again, Rebecca, you're not alone. The short answer to this question is I recommend a sex therapist named Vanessa Marin, and she has a program called Finishing School. And love that name. She goes through. (laughs) Yeah, it's a great name. It's a fantastic name. It's a great name. (laughs) And she goes through in detail and explains to women how to masturbate and how to have an orgasm because the common uh, advice is sort of just relax or 
just experiment. And for a lot of women who did not get the masturbation talk, they need a lot more explicit information about uh, how it all works. And we really do not get that as women often. So Peggy Orstein has an amazing TED Talk where one of the lines that stood out in that talk for me and will stay with me forever is that in sex ed, for men, we learn about erections and ejaculation. And for women, we learn about menstruation. So most sex ed that women get is it's because it revolves around reproduction. Mm -hmm. Uh, We do not get an education on what is actually pleasurable and what the anatomy of pleasure is. We get the anatomy of reproduction. And for men, those two things are absolutely inseparable. And for women, they are not. Mm -hmm. And so it can really be something you need to, you know, get into the nitty gritty about For instance, simple facts. Generally, the clitoris responds more to friction, but the G-spot responds more to pressure. So if you approach the G-spot by doing a lot of friction-based activity, it might not feel so good. Um, And so then there's like, where is the G-spot? Where is the clitoris? All these questions, right? Mm -hmm. That you might need to go from the absolute ground up 101 and, and on. And I think this episode is not the right place to get into every single thing that could be done with a vulva, clitoris, and vagina. And that's why I'm recommending Vanessa. But I think um, getting a more explicit education and really looking into female anatomy is very important. And then from there, after you get into the nitty gritty, then you relax and experiment. So those are the basic steps for masturbation. And, you know, it's also something that's worth just talking about with your female friends. I think often men are much more open about masturbating than women are. Women don't you know, casually talk about jacking off the way men do. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it can be hard to kind of broach the topic. But it's once you get the conversation going with the women that are close to you in your life, it can be easier and easier to talk about. So it's it's worth trying to get some tips and tricks from women close to you. And, you know, Rebecca, I don't think that this is your fault whatsoever, because exactly what Chelsea just said. And I think did I hear right that they just discovered that the clitoris is an an organ all on its own or like in the nineties, this is brand new information in, in terms of like the, the entire extent of human history that this was within our lifetime that they're like, Oh my God, women have a whole system going on down there. And also turns out they can accept pleasure <laughs> and be nice and they deserve it. Nobody said that they deserve it except for us, which is wild. It's all wilds. You know, you're absolutely right. And I didn't put two and two together, Chelsea. So, plainly and so you just said that that you're absolutely right like we just learn about menstruation that's it in sex ed and it leaves it up to you to figure everything else out Mm -hmm. and where are you going to figure it out there's no place to well now we know where to turn but you're absolutely right and the other thing that I want to mention is you know a lot of women are so ashamed of just being a woman and it's by no to no fault of their own it's because society has deemed us you know second class citizens and everything from the moment that you're born essentially is telling you that you should feel shame it's just everything is put on women in terms of like well if you if you weren't so sexy then men wouldn't be chasing after you if you weren't you know what I mean it's, instead of having rules and laws against men it seems like there's rules and laws against women like being in high school and being like well you can't wear spaghetti straps because it's going to turn on all the boys rather than being like well boys why don't you just learn to control yourselves right and so like all of these things feed into the shame that we feel for being a woman and so I say all of this because I think that even just like acknowledge not even acknowledging your vagina but like looking at it Mm -hmm. you know what I mean just touching it, just like and touching it and not feeling like icky or weird or like grossed out. Like these are things that I know this because I speak with so many women and I know so many women who are just like, you know, exactly what Rebecca is saying. I grew up in the church and I just feel so much shame about like even wanting to have sex or even wanting mm-hmm. to masturbate or wanting to have an orgasm or I've never had an orgasm. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's just worth saying, Rebecca, you're not alone. I think go and read those books. Come as you are. Great name. Let us know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, the full extent of the clitoral complex was only mapped within the past 20 years. It turns out the part that can be seen visually is only the tip of the iceberg, if you will. But there is an entire organ that uh, extends uh, upwards into the body, just like the penis. And then it has legs, which actually wrap around the vagina. So these legs wrap around the midsection of the vagina 
And that's actually what the G-spot is probably, is that you're actually stimulating the internal clitoris from inside of the vagina. I mean, it's really quite fascinating that these things were not known until recent times. And um, I think it's also worth saying that the landscape of sex has just changed so much also recently because of birth control. So in not so long ago, having sex could get you pregnant by definition, and Mm -hmm. that could change your entire life. And I think it's very easy to kind of make that into uh, the solution is, well, don't do it uh, or or else get ready to have a baby in a lot of cases. And Mm -hmm. so now we have a world where that's not the case anymore. And so there's a lot more space for sexual exploration. And that's why People like Betty Dodson uh, in the 70s went and got women to look at their vaginas in the mirror in circles and things like this because it's a sort of new world and we're kind of only in the very beginning stages of what that might end up looking like. Yeah, we should all get in circles and look at our vaginas. I feel like still people don't do that. You know what I mean? (laughs) Well, I mean, you see a lot of vulvas, Elizabeth. I see a lot, a lot. I'm not the average person. I'm not the average woman. And I know this because of the amount of questions that people ask me, the amount of women who say, well, my vagina is ugly. I'm so sorry. You have to look at this. I'm like, what are you talking about? They all look the same. They all look exactly the same, but different. Just like tits. They all look exactly the same, but different. You know what I mean? It's just like butts. They all look exactly the same, but different. And every, and so many people think that they're like this disgusting troll. And it's like, dude, why do you think this? Like (laughs) we're all the same. I promise you. And so that's why I just try to like normalize this. Like Rebecca, girl, not alone. I promise you, you know? Okay, let's move on to our next question. We have a question from Juniper. Juniper says, what to do when your partner wants to do a sexual thing that you're not comfortable with? This is a a very interesting question to me in general. And the reason why is because the issue of yes and no, or the issue of uh, wanting and not wanting is generally a lot more complex than most people think that it is. So I think we kind of live in a world where the old answer was, especially for women, kind of just do whatever the man wants. And the new answer is definitely don't do anything you don't want to ever. And the realistic truth is that I think neither of those options actually encompasses the reality of what we are facing as both men and women when we have sex and when we engage with our bodies in general, which is that there is a spectrum From wanting with 100% of yourself to not wanting with 0% of yourself. And most of the time, we're not at either end of that spectrum. So most of the time, we're somewhere in the middle. So maybe you are really aroused by your partner, but you're also really tired. So maybe you're at 60% wanting the thing, the sex, right? Or maybe you are not so into a one little thing that they're doing right then, but the rest of the sex you're kind of enjoying. But maybe just they did a dirty talk thing that kind of turned you off, but you like the way that the sex is going otherwise. So you're at, you know, 60%, 50%, right? There's almost no no moments when we're at 100% wanting or absolute not wanting. And usually those moments are very, very clear to us, right? It's the whole middle that's really confusing. So you have to kind of think about this in a more nuanced way when you approach things like that, that question. And then the other end of the question is, well, how badly does your partner want this thing? And are you monogamous, right? So there's many different kind of ways that this could go. So let's say the the person who wants the thing wants it, you know, it's a deal breaker for them. You know, okay, if we don't do X thing, I don't know if I can stay monogamous with you for the rest of my life. And the Person B is sort of at like 30 percent, you know, like I mostly don't want this, but there's like 30 percent of me that could be okay with it. Mm. Then you might consider in that case trying to kind of try it very slowly. Don't don't go full bore into the thing you don't want to do, but just experimenting with with some part of it and see if it you could you could be okay with it. On the other hand, if you're at 10%, 5%, like you really don't want this thing. And the person who who you're with is sort of like, well, it's not a deal breaker. I could live without it. Don't do it, right? And then there's the, the, the issue of trust and the issue of sort of the relationship context. So your relationship with someone you've been with for 10 years who has shown themselves to be extremely trustworthy, emotionally communicative, committed, caring, sensitive, attuned, 
is different than a one night stand vastly. Right. So the Mm -hmm. degree of risk that you would want to take with those two situations is very different. So generally, if there's a big discrepancy. So if you're if you're having a one night stand, in my view, I would probably not do anything that's 50 percent or below. Right. If you only want it halfway, I would just not with someone you don't trust. But if you're with someone who's long term and you can kind of experiment and play with things that might not feel amazing and make sure that if you say no at any moment and you want to back out of the sexual situation, your partner will absolutely respect it, then it might be something that's more flexible, right? And so essentially it's sort of, I think these canned answers don't work. Like, well, just don't do the thing because you don't want to or well, you should have to do it because your partner wants it. Neither of those is the answer. I think it's a flexible exploration to, in most long-term relationships, it's highly unlikely that both people will have the exact same sexuality. Best case scenario is you have a Venn diagram in which most of it overlaps. Like That's the person you should marry, probably, right? Is where it's like 90% of your sexuality and their sexuality overlap. So what do you do with those areas that don't overlap? This is a real question, right? And best case scenario is you experiment and figure it out. How flexible are you with doing the thing? How flexible are they with not doing the thing? And then you see where you can kind of meet in that situation. And I will say, I think a really, really good rule of thumb is you can back out at any time. So Mm. if you try something you're not sure you want to do, the person who wants the thing has to have the rule that if at any second you say no, not only will the th- will you stop experimenting with it, but they will not resent you. Mm. So that enables people to kind of see where their boundaries actually are and where they actually really are in terms of that thing. Maybe they're going to try it and actually find out they really like it. Maybe they try it and they just feel so grossed out or icked out or freaked out or it's just way too much of a violation. And then you back out. And then if your partner is emotionally available and loving, you can deal with that fact. Everything I just said mostly applies to long-term relationships. If it's a stranger, I would just not do the thing. But I think in a long-term relationship, we all have to kind of consider essentially what we can, what part of our sexuality will become kind of an act of service, right? In that Mm. there's stuff that they're going to like that you're not going to be super excited about and maybe even grosses you out a little bit. But if it's really important to them, maybe you want to try it, right? And That depends on how safe you feel, how trusting you feel, and the general dynamics of the relationship. If you're always doing stuff that they want to do and they're not coming your direction at all, bad sign, right? You don't want to be in a situation with sex or any other aspect of a relationship where, you know, we're always watching the movie you want to watch, never the movie I want to watch. That's bad. That Stop doing that, right? Go more in your direction. Make them do what you want. But if if it's mostly even and fair, then maybe there's a night you want to watch, you know, Okay, person A wants to watch a horror film. Person B wants to watch a children's movie. Well, you either find something in the middle or you trade off. What? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a very, very long answer. But I think it's it, it's worth going into just because I do think this is, is, again, much more common than people talk about. Right? And worth just considering with that level of nuance, in my view. Well, so much of what you said is awesome. But also, number one, what I heard was boundaries, which is Mm -hmm. important in so many aspects of life, just to have boundaries with yourself and the rest of the world, whether that's your partner, your friends, your boss, whatever it is, and know your boundaries and don't allow them to be rubber. Right. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I heard is, um, you know, I often hear a lot of people going one way or the other in that, well, I want this and I want that. Or, the opposite where it's just like, well, he wants this or they want that and they want that. Whereas it's, you're absolutely right. It's, it's a given, it's a take. Mm-hmm. You ha- there has to be compromises and it can't always mm-hmm. be about you and it can't always be about them. And sometimes mm-hmm. you're going to want them to do something that they're kind of like, oh, really? Mm-hmm. But you're going to want them to do it because mm-hmm. it can't always be one way or the other. So I love that you brought up compromise and not even compromise, but just um, being generous Just being generous in life, being generous to your lover, being generous to your friend. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. There's some compromise. I think you put it well. There's some balance between boundaries and generosity in all long-term relationships. You want to have good boundaries. You also want to be generous. And you have to figure out where that line is. And I will say, in terms of sex, there are certain things that this sort of negotiation really applies to more than others. So 
Some things I do not recommend doing this for. For instance, anal sex. I do not think anyone should try putting things up their butt if they don't want them there. Uh, Or any kind of penetration, really, right? Because your anal sphincter is something that basically when you're afraid or when you're resistant, it's just going to close tighter and tighter and it will be painful. Mm. On the other hand, if it's just, you know, uh, my partner really wants me to say this thing to them in sex that is like their kink and I, it's not my kink and it kind of grosses me out. Maybe try it, right? I mean, it's not going to hurt you physically, and it's probably not going to traumatize you for life, right? So there's more high risk and low risk kind of things to to experiment with in this regard. And I think some sort of compromises, if if someone wants to do sort of an act that is really something you don't want to do, for instance, group sex or something to do with kink that is very, you know, intense or it feels like too violent for you or something like that. Those things are are more tricky areas. So there's compromises like, can we talk dirty about this while having sex but not actually do the thing, right? Mm. So if the person or if people are okay with watching porn, which always I vote for ethically made porn, women made porn, whatever, maybe you could put a porn on of the thing and have sex while the porn is happening, right? If you really don't want to do it, is there a way to compromise on like having it be a flavor or, okay, I want to have a threesome, I don't. Well, what about we talk dirty about some woman that you think is hot, like some hot waitress you met, right? But we don't actually have sex with the waitress together. I think so. There's ways of making these things more safe and you have to evaluate on a case by case basis. What is the thing that they want? There are certain things that it's like I said, penetration related stuff, anything to do with hardcore kink or group sex or things that it's if it is a no for you, I really do recommend just saying no. Right. And then there is stuff that's a little more flexible. And I think that's kind of common sense. And you can feel in your body what what feels like that if you did the thing. And it went wrong. It might break the relationship. Don't do that thing. Just don't even Mm -hmm. just don't even mess with that thing. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. You're the greatest. All right, let's move on to the next question. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. 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 I was asking Alex if that should be the new tagline for BetterHelp. And sometimes I just like to sing because... Singing is even better than therapy sometimes, but when you can't just sing your way through life because life has real problems and you need real help, that's when you can call a therapist. And as we are all figuring out, life doesn't come with a user manual. So when it's not working for you, it's normal to feel stuck. Navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure whether it's a career change, a new relationship, or becoming a parent. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills. Productive coping skills, the best. Which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. And darling, you are very complex. I know I am. BetterHelp is connected to over 3 million people with licensed therapists. It's convenient and accessible anywhere, 100% online. You know, at 34 years old, I thought that I had a lot of confidence and that I had overcome insecurities from my 20s, but it turns out I haven't fully. And therapy has helped me so much to just make me feel more self-empowered and give me the confidence I need as an adult woman going through the world. And I just feel so grateful for it. And also, it's been interesting to see my transition from when I was in therapy back in my 20s versus now. So even if you have been to therapy before, it's always helpful to revisit that part of your life and how you operate. So we really love BetterHelp. It's the world's largest therapy service. BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash true beauty. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash true beauty. We have a question from Leslie. Leslie says, how do you keep it sexy and spontaneous when in a long-term relationship? I think there's two main pieces of advice here. 
And I will I will refer in this case to one of my mentors and teachers whose name is Michaela Boehm. She's a relationship counselor in L.A. and she has a lot of work uh, that she's done with couples and singles and women on this very topic. And it's sort of her specialty. So I would look her up. Uh, It's really, really a lot of good resources that she has in this regard. But to kind of take a page from her book and a page from some other books, um, I think there are two main things that really create a spark in long term relationships. And they're kind of uh, seemingly contradictory. So the first thing is emotional connection and vulnerability and honesty. If you're in a situation where you've developed resentments towards each other and there is a ton of unsaid stuff that has never been flushed out, you can kind of get into a situation where both people are just developing calluses towards each other over time, right? Mm. So you're putting up more and more walls. And while that might be kind of functional and fine for getting uh, the household chores taken care of and all of the other things that are involved in a long-term relationship besides sex, like the friendship part, in the sex part, it's probably not going to work so well because having sex from a really guarded place is generally just not as pleasurable as having sex from a really unguarded place. And mm. that's not just woo-woo uh, fluff. It's It really has to do with neurochemistry because when we feel bonded to someone, we really we secrete a bunch of happy hormones and oxytocin and oxytocin is... Uh, you know, especially for women, we have oxytocin receptors on our clitoris and cervix and we have them in our brain. Mm. So what happens is there's a bi-directional feedback loop that occurs where when you feel bonded and you feel close, you get aroused. When you feel aroused, you get uh, bonded and close and so on and so forth. But that loop can start going in the other direction as well. We don't feel close. We don't feel aroused. And then the less mm-hmm. aroused we feel, the less close we feel. And the less close we feel, the less aroused we feel. And this is happening quite literally in your body and brain and in your relationship. So that's one end of it is that whatever you haven't said and whatever lies you're telling to each other, it's in the air. Everyone feels it. And if you don't talk about it and you don't clear the air, it's just going to create barriers. Those barriers will make you have bad sex over time. The other part is sort of seemingly uh, completely contradictory from that, which is what Michaela talks about a lot, which is that you have to continue to develop a sense of yourself separate from your partner. Mm -hmm. So no matter how positive the relationship is, if you become the same person, it's not sexy anymore. So if you and sometimes this can it's sort of often one or the other is the problem and sometimes both. If you become uh, so similar to your partner that you're no longer differentiated from them, it can kind of be like rubbing two magnets together where there's no charge anymore. The, mm. the 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 thing the difference that created the interest has has completely disappeared. There's no more fantasy, no more intrigue, no more space between you to be closed, right? Mm. So part of what creates that electricity is the desire to get closer. If you're already as close as possible, meaning you are the same person, there will be no distance to desire to close erotically. Mm. And so part of this is just maintaining your own interests, spending time apart. If you have a really strong routine and you're besties, then you have to re-remember what it was like when you were first dating and you didn't know each other that well. Find new things about yourself and also new things about the relationship. And then I think, finally, um, curiosity. Mm -hmm. So I always think that people are almost infinitely non-knowable if you're curious enough. So as soon as you assume that you know everything about someone, that's when you're going to get bored, whether emotionally or sexually. But almost always there's something it takes. I would say I think there really is almost no point in time when you can't bring curiosity to someone and learn something new. And part of that is because human beings are not static objects. We're evolving processes every minute and second we're different and Mm -hmm. especially over time and when you stop being curious about your partner when you don't give them room to be new Mm -hmm. then you can get very bored but I think we live in this society where 
We're so used to being hyper-stimulated from the outside in. We're used to something evoking our attention. We're given a constant barrage of new information so that our brain is automatically engaged. And so a lot of us don't develop the ability to voluntarily engage our attention and curiosity on seemingly static objects. And I mean, this is why I love meditation, because when you meditate, you realize that so many things that you thought were solid are actually in flux. And this applies the most to other people. Mm -hmm. And so it's about kind of taking responsibility for one's state of internal awareness and being able to pay attention and be curious about something that seemingly is the same as it was yesterday, except it's really not. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so I think those are kind of the three pillars of how you keep things alive, right? Because when you start to get bored with the person and see them as something known, or when you start to become so enmeshed with them, or when you start to distance yourself from them, all all of that, what it is, is is a lack of newness, right? It's It's like this assumption of sameness that reinforces a sense that things are boring. So those are my three pillars of how to keep it alive in in long-term relationship. I hope that's helpful. You said so many incredible things. What I loved about the first thing that you said was uh, resentment builds calluses. And it's so true. And I also think that this question goes back to the first question that you answered about anxiety, right? It's interesting that it's all tied into the same thing, right? Being comfortable, being relaxed, and being able to get into that place. And if... Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, life happens at all the, like all the time and we're always stressed out. We always have all these outside forces, but it's kind of seems like it's about getting back to that place of just relaxation and safety. Relaxation, safety, uh, some amount of relaxation and safety and some amount of excitement and novelty is the key for every answer to do with sex. Yeah. And it has to go back to exactly what we talked about in the beginning. It's that the nervous system, the human nervous system is wired so that that is the key to getting aroused. And so almost every sex question can be distilled, not almost every, but a lot of them can be distilled into which side of this equation isn't working? Is it the safety relaxation side or is it the excitement novelty side? And then depending on which side it is, there's different answers. And we've covered a lot of those answers in this episode. The thing is that we often don't know quite how to relax. And we also don't know how quite how to engage and get excited and find newness. Mm -hmm. So it takes developing these things as an active skill. You know, we we live in this world where you we're all often from a young age, we learn a lot of abstract information, but we often don't really learn the ins and outs of our own nervous system, right? Yeah, um, never. And then we kind of expect other people to do us in in life and in sex. So, okay, well, if I want to relax, I'm just going to go get a massage or I'm going to do I'm going to have someone else relax me. And if I want to get excited, I'm going to have someone else titillate me or I'm going to have Instagram excite me or I'm going to go to right. And so kind of spending time with oneself and, you know, if you're in the bath, these body scan type of exercises are very useful. Right. So instead of kind of only expecting the outside world to relax, you really taking the time to actually spend some time focusing on your own body and really exploring as much of it as you can with as much detail and seeing which muscles can you actually relax and especially deep into the center of the body and the heart and the guts and the pelvic floor and all of these areas, getting to kind of really focus on yourself and how can I learn to really relax my body is a useful skill. And similarly, on the other end about excitement and novelty, the same thing applies. So How can I engage with my environment and my mind with my mind in a way that I am interested in it instead of making your partner or the world be responsible for you being interested? Mm -hmm. What attitude do I need to take? Mostly it's, in my opinion, it's curiosity, a deep level of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Usually boredom is really a result of not enough curiosity or not enough attention. When you pay deep attention and you're very, very deeply curious, you can become interested and excited and engaged with almost anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and what curiosity requires is getting out of your own way. Mm. So if you are so busy thinking your own thoughts about things, you know, all those people that you're in a conversation with them and you can tell they're just thinking of what they're going to say about what you're saying. Yes. They're not actually listening to you. They can't even stop thinking for long enough that they're actually able to listen. That dynamic occurs a lot in our society. And it's especially happening with the advent of sort of social media as the 
the personal brand being the most important thing that we're doing in our day. It's because what curiosity requires is exactly the opposite of what Instagram requires. Instead of thinking about how you're appearing and what your image is and what you're going to say and what you're going to comment and all of those things, it's actually about totally letting those things go and allowing for what's outside of you to completely engage your attention. Mm -hmm. And so those two skill sets, I think, I, I wish that we all were trained in how to deeply relax and how to deeply engage because that is really what good sex requires. And it requires for both people to do it with each other. Mm hmm. You know, I heard, um, I'm not sure who initially coined this phrase, but everything that's on earth that's alive either grows or dies mm. is so applicable to so many aspects in life, but relationships as well. If you're not mm. constantly trying to grow, trying to stay engaged is exactly what you're saying, trying to stay curious, trying to learn more, trying to grow, it just dies. Makes perfect sense. I another another quote from that I love about sex that will always stay with me from Emily Nagoski, the author of that book, is that sexual boredom only occurs uh, if you stop being curious. And instead of viewing your partner as an animal to be hunted for sustenance, you can view them as a source of infinite curiosity. And uh, I probably just butchered that quote, but it's something along those lines. I think often we view our partners as something to acquire. Mm. And then once you've acquired them, what then? Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe initially you would like to hunt them and that's hot. But then at some point you realize that you've captured them. Yeah. And that's when things get complicated because you have to switch from hunting to looking at this human being that you are now with that you've gotten and seeing how you can be infinitely curious about them. And, you know, I think that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to actively be trying to experiment all the time but it does mean that you have to allow for your vision of them to change as they change instead of holding mm. on to the person that you thought that they were yesterday and the week before and the month before and the year before chelsea's dropping gems right now people <laughs> no you're absolutely right you're absolutely right <laughs> Because I think like this idea of like, oh, well, you've changed. Oh, you've changed. And it's like, mm -hmm. yes, because we change. Mm -hmm. We change as people every single day. We change as humans. We evolve. Mm -hmm. I just think that if you stop being curious about your partner, are you still curious about life? I mean, <laughs> granted, your attention could have changed. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But if you're still actively in love with this person and want to maintain the relationship, but you don't want to stay curious with them, and maybe I'm a different type of person, but how could you still... I don't know. Just like I feel like that's what life is about being curious. Right. Mm -hmm. Why else would you wake up every day if you weren't curious mm -hmm. about what could happen? Honestly, if you knew exactly what was going to happen the same day, mm -hmm. every single day, if it Groundhog's Day, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. what would get you out of bed? Just like mm -hmm. the general zest and curiosity for life, I feel like, is what drives humanity forward. Not to be, you know, FDR about mm -hmm. it or anything, but. Well, I think for a lot of people, too, it's also the it's satisfaction and uh, getting what you want is a big motivation. And I think there is, uh, you know, reward circuitry in the human brain is very powerful. And we have these whole sections of our brain that are really devoted to getting stuff and getting food and getting sex and acquiring a partner. And these things are very, very powerful, uh, very inescapable parts of the human experience. And some people like you are more naturally wired towards there being more to life than that. And for other people, it takes... Sometimes it takes getting everything you've ever wanted and realizing that it's not enough to figure out that there's got to be more to life, right? That's why we have uh, movie stars and so on and uh, killing themselves because they had all the money and all the fame and then realized that there there wasn't anything more and then uh, what now and there was nothing else. And I'm not saying that's every movie star that's ever killed themselves. I'm sure suicidality is a co complicated situation, but... Um, the point is that you can have everything and get everything and then realize that it just it wasn't what you thought it was. And so, you know, that's where a lot of religion comes from is what what else are we going to do here besides just consume and acquire? Um, right. And one of the big things I'm passionate about is that whole curiosity thing. And I do think it applies to much more than sexuality. I think it applies to friendships and life and the moment mm -hmm. itself and that our relationship with the moment when we just take a little bit of a step back from it, the moment being about getting what we want and instead get, even just give a little bit more space to 
being curious. What are you going to do once you get it? Being, yeah, what are you going to do once you get it? But the thing is, if you didn't practice being curious along the way, yeah. Well, because honestly, because think about like, uh, when you just said that, I was thinking about this at the, its most basic, right? Like if you say you really want this car, you you really want this dream car, right? You work your whole life to get mm-hmm. this dream car, you get this dream car. But if you're still really curious it's not done because you got the dream car. Now you got to look at the engine. How's this work? What is the leather made of? You know what <laughs> right, I mean? The right, curiosity right, right, right. should continue. because, And that's what is what's next. It's not just mm-hmm. ending at, I got this thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, it just feeds more into what you were just saying. It's just staying curious. And if you stay curious, then it's like infinite, right? I, yeah. And I mean, I think to acknowledge something that I think is kind of obvious, uh, but good to state, um, the unknown is just scary to, you know, for people. And for sure, especially in sexuality, which is what a lot of these questions are about. And yet it's one of the most powerful tools we have. I'm actually editing and writing a book right now on a certain therapeutic technique, which is all about allowing yourself to not know. So instead of having a technique, you just don't have a technique. And you approach the client with genuine curiosity. And these things are clinically proven to help suicidal people and some of the most severe mental health issues on earth to improve. When you actually approach a person and instead of putting your ideas on them about what you think is going on with them clinically, you actually approach with the attitude of not knowing. Unfortunately, we have to write books about these things because it is so hard to do that for most people. Right. (laughs) Because it's scary. Because it's really scary to say, I don't know. I mean, that's why I have so much respect for these people that wrote in. Right. And especially when it comes to sex and romance. I mean, no one really feels super great about themselves when they're, you know, admitting that they don't know what's next sexually. But that kind of having the ability to allow yourself to not know exactly what to say, not know exactly what your partner is going to do or be or not know exactly what to do during sex. It opens up such a vast terrain of possibility. So Mm -hmm. having a little bit of willingness to just open that up, uh, it it's so it's so deeply scary if you've never done it before, but it gets easier the more you do it. Mm. Chelsea, I feel like this was a fantastic episode you gave so much comfort to mm-hmm. the gals that wrote in, to all the beauty baddies. And hopefully they write in some more questions. Because I think yes. this is important. And I think that it's, if they don't come to you, then where are they going to go? There's only so many people who are willing to speak about this openly and honestly. And from such an academic standpoint also, you know, which makes people feel comfortable because it's not shocking. We were speaking about this yesterday, right? Mm-hmm. Because you and I are homegirls and we speak to each other in a mm-hmm. specific way. But every time you come on the show, you say, Elizabeth you're not going to see your homegirl, Chelsea. Like when I speak about this, I speak about this very scientifically. I speak about this very seriously because I want it to be taken seriously and I don't want people to be shocked Mm. and I want people to feel comfortable. And I respect you so much for that. And Mm. I love you and the beauty baddies do too now. Do now too. Yeah. Well, it's one of my passions in life. I always think, and you know, this is a, this is me trying to, trying to walk the talk is that, uh, I always think it's really important to approach some of the most stigmatized, scary things about life in in a way that's as matter of fact as possible. And as kind of not emotionless, because I, I don't feel emo- I'm very passionate about these things and I feel a deep sense of um, how important they are. But, you know, with sexuality, one of the things that often happens is we go into the terrain and when we have not ever gone into the terrain of talking openly about sex, we can get really easily into sort of feeling like they need to giggle or they need to freak out or just the really deep fear or we start swearing or we start doing all of these things that just illustrate that our nervous system is just not, we haven't done this a lot, right? It's not comfortable. And the more you talk about it, which is well, I do all the time, the more it just becomes just another thing that you can talk about and that you can play with and experiment and have fun with. And it doesn't, it's not so, it's not so different from anything else in life. Totally. Yes. It's not stigmatized. It's not taboo. It just is. Uh, thank you for being on the show today, Chelsea. Oh, thank you for having me, Elizabeth. Will you tell everybody where they can find you if you have anything you want to shout out, any handles, whatever? ChelseaFasano.com, C-H-E-L-S-E-Y-F-A-S-A-N-O is my uh, website. Um, And all of my other ways of finding me are attached to there. I'm always happy to answer anyone's 
sex questions usually as long as they're relatively concise via email and my email is there and um chelsea at chelseafasano.com incredible all right we'll be right back So, what did you guys think of this episode? I love Chelsea. One of the reasons that I begged her to come on, and trust me, it was last minute. (laughs) She loves me because I begged her to come on like two days before we did this episode. And the reason I wanted to have her specifically is because it goes back to removing the shame element of you know, being a woman, period. And Chelsea speaks about relationships and the general state of humanity and sex in such an inviting and inclusive and accepting way. And in order for it to become normalized for women to just like, you know, love ourselves, love our bodies, love everything that life has to offer, we have to explore these topics. We have to speak openly about them. We have to talk about our anxieties. We have to talk about our concerns and we have to be able to voice our questions so that we can have you know, just like a great life, just an empowered life. And that's all that I want for the beauty baddies. That's what I want for all of us. So hope that you loved this episode. I definitely did. Let us know. And um, coming up next, guys, I can't believe we're almost in 2023. I know that last week we teased you about new skincare episodes and uh, they're coming. You got to give your girl some time. I'm busy. But you know that I've been doing some deep dives with Zach Bauman. Her new book just came out, the third edition of Cosmetic Dermatology. So I'm learning about all of like the latest skincare research for you guys. It's going to be great. So starting in January, we're going to have some really great skincare deep dive episodes. Thanks for hanging on. Thanks for bearing with us through the end of the year. You guys can always DM or email us your listener letters and your beauty baddie moments of the week. And you can also nominate somebody to be inducted into the uh, Bad Bitch Almanac. You can do that at True Beauty Brooklyn Podcast on Instagram or True Beauty Brooklyn Podcast at gmail.com. You can follow our our personal Instagram accounts. Alex is at Alex Lindley. Chelsea is at Chelsea.lee.fasano. That's C H E L S E Y dot L E E dot F A S A N O. I'm at the Brown Elizabeth Taylor. I think you know how to spell that. (laughs) You can make an in-person or a virtual appointment at truebeautybrooklyn.com to hang with me, Elizabeth. And you can make an in-person appointment with Alex at cheekybrooklyn.com. You can learn more about Chelsea at chelseafasano.com. And that's it. We'll see you guys next week. Bye. The True Beauty Brooklyn podcast is produced by Beta Wave and Elizabeth Taylor and is mixed by Beta Wave. Follow us on Instagram at True Beauty Brooklyn Podcast. And if you'd like to further support the show, consider leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. 